and welcome to the stream. I'm Father Roderick, behind the microphone on a Saturday afternoon, almost evening, recording my weekly show, and it's probably going to be one of the last times before my vacation that I'm recording this uh, on a real studio microphone, because I will be out of town for the next three weeks. So I'm taking advantage of this occasion to record uh, a show on my regular podcasting equipment. We'll be talking about movies, about Lego, about, um, well, many other topics. Tech, I'll give you a review of this thing. My brand new Zenfone 6 with the pop-up camera, which is really cool. And uh, hello, Lars. Hello, Adam. Hello, Arnold. Welcome to the stream. And as usual, while I'm recording the show, I won't be able to look at the chat that much. But if you have any questions, keep them for uh, the end of the recording. And then we'll have time to chat a little bit. So I'm going to conjure up my uh, my show notes. As you can see on this uh, video with a wide angle, you'll be able to see what I see on the screen. So it's a little bit of a behind-the-scenes look as well. And uh, I've been struggling a little bit with the streaming software that I'm using on the phone. So I'm using a little app on the iPhone that is sending the camera signal to the computer so I can stream it but I can't set it to uh, full HD. I can only do 720p for some reason. Uh, last week it worked fine. Now it doesn't. <laughs> That's always the same. When you need it to work, it doesn't work. Um, okay, I'll just keep this in the background because I don't need to see myself. What's my opinion about the GoPro Hero 7? Um, I don't know. I'm... I. I have a GoPro, an old GoPro, it's at least four years old, and I, I didn't like it at all, <laughs> mostly because of the the audio problems, um, didn't have decent audio, it was hard to attach a microphone, but I, I guess the newer GoPros have uh, amazing stabilization and uh, maybe also easier setup for, a, for an external microphone. You thought it was all in you in my head. Oh, the the entire show, you mean? <laughs> well, it is. Like here, this, these are my show notes. So I'm not reading the entire show. I just have like five topics <laughs> and the order in which I'm going to talk about them. But I keep a log of all the topics for uh, Inga, who is putting this online later. And for the show notes, she needs to know what I've talked about. All right, well, let's go and record this so I can go home. Here we go. Hello and welcome to another episode of my weekly show. I'm Father Roderick. We're recording this barefoot like a hobbit. <laughs> and my feet are cooling down after a long training walk. The last training walk before the big four-day walking event that I'll be participating in or partaking in next week. This episode is brought to you thanks to my patrons over at patreon.com slash Father Roderick. I really appreciate their monthly support. Do you know what's going on? This is what's happening in your world. They said Catholics rule. We got Boston, South America, the good part of Ireland, and we're making serious inroads in Mozambique, baby. You've taken your first step into a larger world. So I've been walking uh, for a couple of hours uh, today. Not that much. It's like when you're training for a marathon. Usually when you're approaching the race, you, you tend to run less and less. So you keep your energy for, uh, for the big event. This is a slightly different. So I'm going to walk four days from Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. Every day I'm walking 40 kilometers starting at either 4 o'clock in the morning or 5 o'clock in the morning so that we arrive around noon. And uh, I'm raising money for charity, so that's 160 kilometers, and I'm raising money for, uh, for um, uh, mothers, expectant mothers and young mothers and their children, either unborn or born. And um, uh, it's, uh, the, the, the project try, wants to provide care and, um, and sometimes free medication also for these women in 
uh, in, in poorer countries. So that gives me a reason to walk. And, uh, but I, I had the wrong type of socks on my feet this morning. So I, I have these socks that I bought when I was walking to Santiago de Compostela. And I wanted to have a, a good system because socks are so important. Shoes and socks are the most important ingredients for a successful or an unsuccessful walk. They, they often contribute to either a carefree walk or a walk uh, full of blisters. And blisters is not fun. I can tell you that from experience. So I have... Um, still have these socks that I that I um, use during the Camino. I had two pairs, uh, one for, for uh, alternate days, and then when one pair was on my feet, the other pair was drying because I washed them every evening. But for this four-day event, I wanted to get two new pairs of socks. But of course, it's now three years later, so they don't didn't have exactly the same the same... Well, they had the same brand, but not the same type of socks, so I had to... Uh, kind of uh, test them out and uh, I have actually every day I wear two pairs of socks I have um, these uh, well kind of very lightweight um, uh, inner socks they're very thin and these are actually meant to cool down your feet and to transmit the perspiration um, from your feet to the outer sock which is made out of wool sounds kind of Contrary to what you think, when because I always associate wool with very warm feet, but this wool actually helps your feet to stay cool as well. Plus, they also help in getting rid of the of the moisture from your feet, which then in 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 turn also prevents blisters. Um, so it took a while to test them out, and for so for today, I um, I was wearing socks in my walking boots that uh, were gifted to me on my birthday, I think, two years ago. And those socks are also made for hiking, but I don't like them at all. I get very, very warm feet. I think they're winter socks or something like that. They have, they have the opposite effect of these professional walking socks, uh, and that is they seem to retain moisture and, and heat. And so I arrived here at the studio uh, to record this, and I was like, I got to get out of these shoes and out of these socks. It's terrible. So my feet are now on the floor, and the floor is really cool. <laughs> and I feel like Bilbo Baggins <laughs> cooling down my feet, and I will, I will put on the new socks that I just bought to when I walk home. This has been a very busy week. I talk about it at length also in my other show, my other weekly show, The Walk, so... If you go to tridio.com, you will be able to find the feed to that particular um, series of podcasts. Uh, but in a nutshell, we've been uh, doing, we've, we started the renovation of the studios. I'm recording this in the studio downstairs, which is the one that we uh, uh, refurbished uh, two years ago, I think. But upstairs, um, nothing was done and everything still. Uh, looks pretty terrible, <laughs> and it was in dire need of a of a fresh coat of paint, and uh, and also we need to create places where our editors can work. So that was a big um, event. Almost we 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 got together with uh, six people, and we worked all Thursday long. We ended it with a barbecue because <laughs> you have to feed your flock, and uh, and it was great. But uh, there's still a lot of work to be done. Um. I'm also very excited about uh, one of those uh, upstairs spaces that we're going to transform into a, a kitchen that we can use for, for video for, uh, to record cooking shows. Um, instead of going... Well, we, we, we have a cooking series on the Dutch channel, and it's been very successful. Um, but they had one downside. You had to travel the entire country to go and film in someone else's kitchen where you don't have proper lighting oftentimes. You may have a very noisy kitchen... Um, it, it may be against the wall, so it's very hard to get the camera in front of the people. So a lot of disadvantages. And so we said, well, since we're going to renovate upstairs anyway, why not rebuild an entire kitchen, but to, to build it in such a way that it is much easier to film in that kitchen. And we have like the proper lighting and, and it will have a cooking island, so it's much easier to, um, to, to produce more cooking episodes. And I'm secretly thinking, Maybe I can do something for my international audience with that as well because I, I did some cooking a long time ago 
and it was a lot of fun. I posted the, the recipes on YouTube, and uh, that also, there's a, a lot of interest for, for that kind of stuff. But we'll see. We'll do this step by step. Next week, I'm going to walk, and then I'm going to go to Ireland for uh, about 12 days. So it's only after three weeks that we ret- that I return and that we can continue to build and, um, uh, and paint the uh, upstairs. Um, back home, I, um, I'm, I've built another Lego project, which was a lot of fun. I invite you to go over to youtube.com slash Father Roderick and check out the building of Bilbo Baggins' home uh, in the Shire, Bag End. Uh, it was a really fun, kind of a reconstruction project, um, trying to re- recreate the original set, which is very expensive but using cheaper elements, and uh, I'm very happy with the end result. It's, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm now very motivated to create more custom uh, Hobbit Lego projects. So hopefully that's going to that's gonna be a, a nice project for when I'm back from, from vacation. So, um, and then uh, I've also posted another video on YouTube, which if you are a fan of Stranger Things, you have to check out. Uh, it's called My Stranger Things Experience. And this was something that happened to me in Utrecht last week. And uh, there was this promotional event around the third season of Stranger Things on Netflix. And uh, you enter uh, through a door and then it, you, you arrive in a laboratory. Um, and I was chosen to be the guinea pig to, to be tested for telekinetic power. So basically powers so you can move objects from a distance. And I won't, I won't tell you if I have those powers. You have to look for yourself. But it was a really great... Um, basically, for me, it was back to the future. It was going back to, my, to, my, to the 80s. And I grew up in the 80s. So a lot of the environment that they created there, and they did a really terrific job, reminded me of my own youth. Uh, so it was a, a flash from, from the past. It was a lot of fun. Again, the, the video... Yeah, whoops. Sorry about that. The video is up on um, on YouTube, and uh, and while you're there, make sure you subscribe. And if you've never been to my YouTube channel, there are a lot of videos. Just the other day, all my Scottish videos start to reemerge. So for some reason, the algorithm of YouTube is serving them to new viewers. So I get a lot of comments on <laughs> on the videos that I filmed in Scotland. When was that? Like three, or four years ago? Unbelievable. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk movies and TV shows. How do you not like movies? They're predictable. Like, the guy gets the girl and that kid sees dead people and Darth Vader is Luke's father. Not liking movies is like not liking puppies. They're fine. I just get bored and never make it to the end. You know, you need a movie education. You need a movication. Now I'm going to give it to you. So, I, um, I was very tempted this past week to get a, a Lego set which was heavily discounted. I think this is also because of Amazon Prime Day approaching and uh, some of the older sets are now getting discounted because they want to clear inventory. And that set was the Lego Ninjago City, which is based on um, a fictional city uh, in the Lego Ninjago movie, which was one of those animated movies in the vein of, um, uh, what was it, uh, Bat- the Batman Lego movie, Lego Movie 1 and 2. And Ninjago is a, an intellectual property of Lego itself. Of course, they're using a lot of existing intellectual properties like Star Wars and, and uh, well, the Lord of the Rings and uh, uh, superheroes. But they also want to, of course, develop their own themes uh, So because then it's much cheaper for them. They don't have to pay licenses. So they, they made this movie based on, a, on an animation series uh, featuring these Lego ninjas. I had never seen any of that, so I didn't. I didn't watch the Lego Ninjago movie. I've I've, I've watched a part of it last night, um, but I remember that my the youngest son of my brother talked about it and was uh, a while ago, and was very uh, loved it very much. Uh, had seen the entire series. Turns out this is like a six uh, season series that I'd never checked out. So I found it on Netflix. And started watching the first season, and it's actually quite enjoyable. It's a it's a simple story. It reminds me a tiny little bit of Avatar, the la, the la, the Airbender series, not the movie Avatar, but the and also not the movie based on the animated series, but the animated series 
of Avatar, uh, which is a really brilliant series. Um, so it's about this, this, these four young guys that are being trained. And there's a girl, so trained as ninjas by this uh, bearded um, uh, wise man. And uh, they have to face uh, like an evil guy and it was i think uh, destroying the city on a daily basis <laughs> it's a lot of fun and so the the movie uh takes place part for part part of the movie in a bustling city it looks a little bit like japan uh hong kong it's an oriental city and this set is is a, a basically a, a, th- a three or four story high rendition of that city it looks amazing it was expensive it was very expensive 250 euros um, uh, but that was with a 25% discount and it looks amazing. It's so, f- I love these, these visual sets. If, if there's one thing that I've learned it, over the past few months building these projects is that I prefer to, to build little cities or houses or, um, things with minifigures in it. I enjoy that much more than, than spaceships or vehicles. So the technical builds are not really my thing. Uh, because it's just not much, it's a lot of the same. So I, I loved building Bilbo Baggins' homestead because you're building a place where stories take place. So um, while I was deliberating on whether to buy that big Ninjago city set or not, I was watching the, that first season of Lego Ninjago. And um, it's, it's not really done as well as the, as the Lego movies, the cinematic movies, because those are are made to look. It's all CGI, of course, but they, 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 it looks as if it's filmed with real Lego, whereas these are more animated s- series uh, CGI, uh, much cheaper um, visually, and well, they're they're fine. They look a little bit like the cutscenes in the Lego video games. So it's it's okay. Uh, it's entertaining, and I'm starting to really enjoy the Ninjago world, the the stories that they tell. And and, and I'd, I'd seen a lot of those sets, and it never really spoke to me. Now that you get to know the characters and kind of the overall mythology is a big word, but let's say the background story, uh, I'm starting to to enjoy what they what Lego did there because it's a very unique world with or, all these oriental elements but there's it's also very trendy there's also a lot of technology so it's it's, it's very much like i the way i imagine uh tokyo or something like that um and in addition to that i also watched a movie that was on my to watch list but i just couldn't find a time to watch it for some reason and it is the um detective pikachu movie um my my youth was not uh, a Nintendo youth. I'm from the generation before Nintendo. So I kind of missed the entire uh, um, Pokemon craze, um, but got bitten a little bit by it because of the Niantic game that came out two years ago. So I, I walked around f- for months trying to catch Pikachus and, and, and other um, cr- little creatures from the world of Pokemons, or uh, actually they're called Pokemons. And this movie um, is, I think, the first real attempt to do a, like a live action in combination with CGI uh, a movie based on the world of Pokemon. And I'd see the trailer and it looked fun. And I recognized a, a number of those Pokemon monsters because I'd been catching them in the game. So I finally sat down, watched the movie, and came away quite disappointed. Um, it is... It has not. It mu- doesn't have much to do with catching Pokemon, which is kind of the, the 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 main story. Is you have these kids walking around. They want to become Pokemon trainers, so they walk around, catch these Pokemon, train them, and fight other Pokemon. And basically, any every game is based on that premise. In this movie, none of that. It tells the story of a a, a young boy who hears that his father has died, uh, or he's a teenager travels to the city where his father was working as a detective, meets Pikachu, this this yellow uh, uh, creature, m- one of the most famous Pokemons. And to everyone's surprise, he's able to understand Pikachu. And Pikachu talks to him with the voice of Reynolds, who plays uh, Deadpool. <laughs> and uh, uh, But he's the only one that understands, who hears something else, than what other regular people hear. They only hear Pikachu, Pikachu, and he hears uh, like a full-grown detective. 
And then they uh, they try to investigate why, how his father died and the background of all that. The world is done nicely. The, it, it's a bit a mixed bag quality-wise. The first, uh, So this takes place in a world where humans live together with Pikachus, uh, with Pokemons, I have to say, Pokemons. So uh, you enter a city, and half of the city uh, is filled with Pokemons. And and they blend in pretty well. It's it's nicely done, um, and it's fun to see these these little critters that you know from the games in uh, in a real environment. And I have to say, the interaction with the real life actors is is very well done. It's seamless. However, the, the the overall story is so bland and so predictable. And there's some good actors in there, but um, yeah. <laughs> they don't really shine. The dialogue is really geared towards kids, and uh, but the story I think is even too simple for kids. Um, so it felt a bit like the Michael Bay Transformers movies. Of, of course, the, but <laughs> it's very different story, and the Transformer movies uh, are so, uh, very annoying to me because there's a lot of fighting and you don't know what's going on. But they also had that shallowness. Like the plot is always very, very shallow and, and, and the characters are one-dimensional and basically nothing really surprising happens. Well, that, that, that's how this movie felt. It's, it's very well executed CGI-wise, although later on um, there, th- th- some of those, those scenes are not that good and you really can tell that, it, that, that this is, they, they were in a rush or they didn't spend as much money or, as on the earlier part of the movie. Um, but the story is just not very engaging and not very interesting. So, yeah, I would not recommend it. It was uh, it's okay. Perhaps if you're a big Pokemon fan or your kids are, then maybe this may, this is worth your time. But uh, as a regular moviegoer, I was uh, I was bored. <laughs> Let's visit the peculiar bunch. <laughs> Catholics rock. Here at the Peculiar Bunch, we're always happy to tell you everything you always wanted to know about Catholics and Christians, but you were afraid to ask. Catholics can be a peculiar bunch. No meat on Friday. No meat? What do they eat? Light bulbs? And today we are going to talk about caterpillars, spiders, and Pope Francis. And they actually are related. Man, you guys got more crazy rules than Blockbuster Video. I think last week I told you about this caterpillar plague that we have in the Netherlands. It's a, it's a, it's a one of the consequences of the rising temperatures and uh, possibly climate change. These caterpillars um, are uh, this is a very specific type of cal- caterpillars. They grow in groups. They they eat entire uh, trees, oak trees. Only live on oak trees. But they have these spikes, these these little hairs that are very poisonous, and uh, a, a caterpillar goes through several growing stages, just like snakes. They shed their skin, and these little hairs are dispersed by the wind. And when you, as a an animal or a human being, enter in contact with those hairs, it causes a very very annoying rash. It's very uh, can be very painful, but it can also create an incredible itch. One little hair can can cause can give you marks on your legs or on your arms that look like you've been stung by at least a dozen uh, mosquitoes, and it's it's extremely annoying. Uh, people have also gotten these things in their eyes or in the, even inhaled them and cause a lot of lung problems. And this has become a national plague. Uh, it's it's uh, much, much worse compared to last year. And um, and of, uh, the, the, one of the ways in which our government uh, and the cities are trying to combat this is by sucking them up with... <laughs> with uh, specialized uh, crews that are wearing uh, airtight suits. It looks like they're uh, on a moon expedition or something like that. But that, of course, is all symptomatic uh, uh, um, uh, action. The real reason that we have this caterpillar plague is because of our very um, uniform environment, Uh, especially here in the Netherlands, Everything, every oh, then we have a tendency because it's such a small country and we have so many inhabitants that 
every bit of nature is super regulated. So we have a lot of oak trees. This was um, very much the thing to do in city planning. Let's make these broad lanes with tons and tons of oak trees. And then we will put some grass, but we're going to mow the grass like every week. And everything is super tidy. And it turns out that is what's, what's causing the real problems right now. So we, we put a lot of oak trees next to busy roads to kind of counteract perhaps the pollution of those roads and the noise. The thing is, birds don't nest in those trees because birds like to be, you know, in a more quiet environment. And if you don't have birds, you don't have a natural enemy of those caterpillars. So they can grow, expand, uh, multiply... Um, the same is true for a number of insects that normally would eat these caterpillars. Those insects only thrive amongst wildflowers in grass that is not that is you know much higher, much taller than what we have in our cities and in our villages. And so we're slowly discovering that we have uh, our our own short-sightedness to 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 blame for this disaster. Uh, because that's kind of, it's, this is going to be, a, it already is a disaster and it's going to get much worse. I've had trouble with these caterpillars for four weeks now and it is terrible. It, it, right now, they're on my left leg. It's full of those those big red dots and they itch and you can't scratch. If you scratch, it gets much worse. There is, I can feel now that there are a few on my back here underneath my shoulder blades so that's recent that's probably from today's walk and i think i may have had one in my on my upper eyelid because it itches as well and it's red and swollen so and and that's just me and i'm not even going to the doctor we know that uh, that we have hundreds of thousands of people that are suffering the consequences that went to the doctor so this is this is really a catastrophe um, we have our, ourselves to blame for this and this is why these caterpillars have to do with Pope Francis. Because Pope Francis, uh, a couple of years ago, wrote an encyclica, an encyclical letter about creation and about our relationship to the, to the world that God has given us. And, uh, and, 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 and analyzes what happens if we, don't res- if, we, if we mistreat the world in which we live if we destroy nature, if we only use nature for our own, you know, financial gain, and we we, we are destroying our planet uh, at a a very frightening pace. And it has tremendous consequences because, it reminds Pope Francis us, we are all connected. We're connected to each other. We're connected to nature. There is a balance in creation that is God-given, and we are constantly messing this up for our own profit. And oftentimes, and that is one of the main points of criticism of Pope Francis, the, the, the poorest countries suffer the most from our explo- exploitation of, of our natural reserves and of our planet. And so he, he makes a call for more solidarity, not just uh, between human beings, but also uh, solidarity with the planet and the world, the, the the natural world in which we live, and if we don't respect it, it's gonna we're gonna be punished uh, uh, almost immediately. And so, a lot of the natural disasters that that occur, the, the, these huge climate fluctuations, um, the the extreme drought in third world countries, the uh, ever increasing extremes in the weather and we've noticed that here in the netherlands year after year after year we're breaking record after record um if we don't change our behavior and this is where it gets a spiritual component if we don't convert back to uh, a, a, a more selfishless way of treating our natural resources then this will have very dire consequences for the poorest people in the world first but then also for us and that is a real now that we have this 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 uh, catastrophe and there are also a lot of um, uh, other people n- not religious at all that tell the same stories we, we we need to rediscover how nature is supporting us and how we need to treat nature so that it prevents this balance from being uh, disrupted and uh, the you already see in my country that uh, in addition to, of course, the symptomatic approach where they're trying to suck up all these uh, nasty caterpillars, uh, there are already a lot of efforts to uh, 
uh, incentivize people to, for instance, not mow the grass in their garden, to keep you know wild flowers in the back in their front and back garden, to not mow the grass uh, among you know uh, uh, next to our our roads and and lanes. And I can tell the difference. I well, I do a lot of walking nowadays. And there are so many more wildflowers around this time of the year than there were five years ago. And I really love that. It's, it's, it's beautiful. You see all these colors and it's, it's bringing back, it's, it's turning th the Netherlands, which is a very tidy, well-regulated, but also kind of boring country. It's making it look more like the Shire, especially with all those flowers and the high, tall grass and everything. Plus, all those insects will help us combat the bad ones that are so annoying. And this is, of course, just one plague. And we, we can get so many other problems uh, in, the, in the future because there, there are other insects that, because of these rising temperatures, are migrating from the southern countries to the northern countries. Uh, there are certain types of uh, mosquitoes, for instance, that are now uh, seen in, in my country, some even carrying diseases that were only in in North Africa in the past or in in Italy, but they're th so we're, we're this is not this is just the beginning of the story. This is going to get much much worse, and I hope that we can react quickly and swiftly. It has also already uh, impacted the way that I treat the nature around me. For instance, spiders. If you're a longtime listener to my show, you know that I have a great fear of spiders. Not just a regular. Like, ew, yuck. No, I have a completely unreasonable um, Ron Weasley slash Bilbo Frodo fear of spiders. I really hate them. And so I was always trying to keep my house as spider-free as possible. But then I got this, this, these other little critters that are walking around in my house some of which are very fast and very small and they're everywhere they're in the cupboards and they uh, they're very very hard to to combat actually impossible to combat and then I'm thinking well you know what the natural enemy of those of those other insects that are very annoying are spiders and then so in I have a sunroom which is really nice in the summertime very cold in the winter and I noticed that underneath one of the windows, there was this little pile of dead insects. And I was like, how is that possible? Where are these coming from? And uh, why are these insects dying there? And, and, and it's the kind of insect. So every week I would, you know, sweep the floor and, and uh, throw them away. And every week there's a new pile of insects. And it's so weird. And then all of a sudden it hit me. There is a spider behind the radiator. And that spider is Ca catching all those insects and wh what I see on the floor are the remains. They're like the bones of the chicken wings, you know? <laughs> it's like <laughs> it's the result of, the, of dinner time. And from that, so, so now from that moment on, I was like, okay, I think I'm going to try to live with these spiders. I'm going to tolerate them. I will not destroy them anymore. And so now I have in a number of my uh, uh, rooms in, in, in the rectory, I, I've got a few spiders sitting there, not the very big ones. I still think I um, uh, I don't like the shelop type spiders. I may have to do something against those, but the smaller ones, I'll just leave them there because during the night they're doing their job. They're keeping my home free of other insects, and that's just my reconciliation. I never thought I'd see the day that I would be happy to have spiders in my house because they're helping me and they are establishing a certain balance in my house. And I think that a lot of the problems that I had with other insects in my home previously was because of my fear of spiders and because I didn't want any spiders in my home. So I've learned something. Anyway, that's what I wanted to share with you. And now we have to move from the world of spiders and caterpillars and popes to the world of books. Uh, humanoid. That's not the right trailer, uh, the, the right jingle. That is a video game jingle. How is that possible? Oh, I remember. I've been uh, switching those because I didn't have a book re uh, review last week. So I took this jingle from the games to replace the other one. I'm trying to quickly find the other jingle, the book jingle, because I'm a perfectionist. And I've got this big collection of jingles and one of the advantages I can just 
uh, drag and drop these jingles on the player of the roadcaster and then it will upload it to the to the to the machine and i can now press the same same exactly exact same button and hopefully it will give me the book jingle yes it works when did you become an expert in thermonuclear astrophysics last night the packet the extraction theory papers am i the only one who did the reading 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 i love reading I've been trying to find more time to read, and now I have made a discovery that is changing my reading habits again. I've discovered a service called Storytel. It's originally from Sweden, like Swedish meatballs and IKEA. And uh, it is a, a, a company that resembles Audible. Audible, of course, is this American company. It's bought by Amazon, and uh, they give you a subscription model where you pay a certain amount every month and then you can download, I think, two books, one or two audiobooks per month, which is kind of reasonable because most people only read one book per month. Well, Storytel has a different approach. Storytel wants to be the Netflix of audiobooks. So you pay one fee per week, uh, per month. It's uh, in, right now in my country, it's 11.99, so 12 euros per week, per month. That is, that's a lot of money, but... What you get in return is that you can listen to any audiobook from a collection of thousands, tens of thousands of audiobooks. Not just in Dutch, like I initially presumed, but also in English. Most of, like 90% of their catalog is in English. And they have everything. It's unbelievable. And so I, I'm uh, currently on a two-week trial uh, that is free. But I already know after three days that I'm going to get a subscription to this because I have discovered books that I didn't even know existed. And I'm so enjoying this ability to just listen to an audiobook, pick one. I'm just browsing the website. I was like, ooh, I want to listen to that one. And I, I click on it. it. It can download to your phone so you can listen offline as well. It's not just stre streaming. And of course, it's subscription-based. It's different from Audible. With Audible, you get that book and you, you can keep it for the rest of your life. But most audiobooks, I listen to them once. And so I'm totally happy to just rent the books in a certain way. And uh, I've been listening to a couple of books the first one that I listen to is Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them. And it's an audiobook that is uh, uh, made of the, the original book that J.K. Rowling wrote for charity. She wanted to help, uh, I, I think it was a charity for orphanages or, or for orphans. And of course, Harry Potter being an orphan uh, kind of makes sense that, that she was raising money for that charity. And so she wrote a little book with descriptions of all the magical monsters and creatures that we saw in the Harry Potter uh, books and movies, but also a lot of magical creatures that were not mentioned in the books or only mentioned. And this is this was supposed to be a textbook that is was mentioned by Harry and Hermione and Ron uh, and that they were using in their classes at Hogwarts, um, written by Newt Scamander. And of course, that later on became the inspiration for the current movie series that is based on the adventures of, of Newt Scamander. Um, and Newt was a, a mazologist, like a magical zoologist, um, uh, who lived in the, I think in the 30s, so uh, you see the kind of the rise of, um, of, of fascism also in a magical world. And the movies, the current movies, are, are telling there, uh, the stories of, of Newt Scamander. The, the cool thing, so this is not the screenplay for the first movie. That's what I wanted to say. The cool thing about this book is that it is read in its current form by Eddie Redmayne, who is the actor who actually plays Newt Scamander. And they also added a few little uh, 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 extra excerpts at the beginning of that story um, to kind of uh, explain why... Uh, how the, how this book ties into the to the story of the the developing story of the movies, and of course, kind of tricky because uh, J.K. Rowling doesn't doesn't want to spoil the the upcoming movies, uh, and yet the, you can you can be you can bet that all the creatures that are in the original Fantastic Beasts manual will play a role in in the current and in the future movies. So here's a little fragment of that book uh, read by uh, Eddie Redmayne. 
about the creation of fantastic beasts and where to find them. Here we go. I'm not yet in a position to tell the full story of my activities during the two decades that Gellert Grindelwald terrorised the wizarding world. As more documents become declassified over the coming years, I will be freer to speak openly about my role during that dark period in our history. So you, you, you hear, now, you hear the voice myself to correcting of Eddie Redmayne, and, and it really helps to, to... It makes the book much more appealing because it's actually the professor himself that is reading to you. And he does a very good job also. Um, some of the... Of the uh, so it's like, like a dictionary of animals, and so it, a lot of the entries are accompanied by sound effects that are coming from the movies and from the studio where the where the movies were filmed, and that also enhances the experience of the of the book quite a bit. So this is just one of those one of those uh, audio books where I think uh, the audio aspect of it really adds to the overall experience of the story and it's not really a story but of the of the book itself it's, it's a very quick read i think i it takes about 2 or 3 hours but i enjoyed it very very much and it's a, one of those books that i would probably not read if it was just on paper uh, but with the sound effects and with the voice of uh, Eddie Redmayne, it 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 turns into a really enjoyable experience. Another book, and this is a much much bigger book. It's 22 hours long. Um, that I'm currently reading or listening to is riveting. This this alone makes it worthwhile to subscribe to Storytell for me, and it's a book called Anything You Can Imagine: Peter Jackson and the Making of Middle Earth. It's written by Ian Nathan. And read by Tristan Weimark, has a great reading voice, and it describes the uh, history of Peter Jackson's Middle Earth saga. So, uh, and, and it starts years and years before the even the project got started. So it tells the story of how uh, Tolkien lost the rights, the movie rights, and the gaming rights, also the video game rights. Um, and, and why he sold the rights to those books. Um, how for, for decades people have been trying to turn this into movies, um, something that, that Tolkien was very skeptical about. And then at one point Peter Jackson gets interested. But that it's unbelievable if you hear how many hurdles they had to take before they could start making these movies. So it's also a history of the movie industry in Hollywood, in New Zealand, it takes place in a lot of different countries. And um, it's so well told. And it's based, I think, on a lot of interviews with Peter Jackson and, um, and Fran and Philip O'Boyens. Uh, those three always work together to write the, the scripts. And also gives you very good insight in, in Peter Jackson's own way of thinking. And he's not, uh, Peter Jackson is not religious, as far as I know. But he believes in fate. He believes that he was meant to make these movies, and um, and and that his his way of life, which is also very uh, very char characteristic for for um, the the New Zealand lifestyle. I, I I recognize in his style. That's why I, I enjoy these audio commentaries so much um, because. He, he is very much like my, my other friends in, in uh, kind of a consider Peter Jackson a friend, even though I've never met him. I almost met him when I was there. Oh, man. I was doing a visit of Weta Studios in, uh, in Wellington. And uh, a friend of mine was coming to pick me up after the tour. And so I came out after this two-hour tour. And he said, you just missed Peter Jackson. He literally just walked by. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, Peter Jackson uh, is it, it's it's a very laid back, very pragmatic attitude, um, uh, very calm. Not at all this frenetic, you know, uh, like uh, pushy atmosphere of of Hollywood um, and and kind of this American business life that he needs to deal with anyway. Um, so it's a really fascinating story, and it, it again it shows me how much love went into the creation of these movies, and also explains uh, sometimes the, the choices that we as Tolkien fans never understood, like why why is it so commercial? Why why are they milking this story? And and uh, it also explains, I think, a lot of of, of how The Hobbit turned into a three movie e uh, epic. Uh, this was never. Um, Peter Jackson's choice um, but it's just the way the movie industry works 
and and uh, and he has to deal with it. And I think, given the circumstances, I have so much admiration for what they've been able to pull off. I don't think we'll ever see uh, a movie series um, of this quality. And I can only hope that this upcoming Amazon Middle Earth series will take cues from from this book, from from the experiences of, uh, of Peter Jackson. Because telling a story and filming a movie is one thing, but the business aspect and what's going on, the negotiations, and how sometimes by sheer luck something happens that leads ultimately to the creation of, the, of these movies, it's unbelievable. I would say, instead of calling it fate, I would call it providence. Maybe this is a story that needs to be told in in movie form and i know that a lot of people have discovered tolkien through the movies and then thanks to the these movies discovered the catholic world and and world view of peter jackson and 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 so who knows what role in god's overall plan uh, a guy like peter jackson plays and if you see how often this could have gone wrong this this movie is it's almost a small miracle that these movies were ever made so uh, that is why I love listening to this book. It's very. I'm just gonna again play a little fragment of the of the story, um, just to to give you a sample of the of the reading voice of this book. You can sense it. It was absolutely extraordinary. You don't know. You could never know. Here, finally, was the first proof that a level of psychological and emotional detail could be conveyed through ones and noughts, that thought could be conveyed through the combination of my performance and what they were doing at Weta Digital. This is, this is a, a, the preface um, uh, by um, the guy who, who plays Gollum. Uh, name escaped me here for a second. But anyway, the, the, this is the type of voice that I can listen to for hours and hours and hours. Peter Jackson and the Making of Middle-Earth Anything You Can Imagine by Ian Nathan. Highly recommend it. We are on the cutting edge of technology. Wow. Well, what does that mean? Let's plug it in. It's going to say, hey, I see you plugged in a new device. And it's going to load in the appropriate drivers. You'll notice that this scanner built... Whoa. Well, all your technology stuff just ends in disaster. But there is one more thing. And I've been playing with my new phone for one week now, and it is really, really good. I'm, I'm, I'm so glad that I got this phone. I'm talking about the uh, Asus Zenfone 6, a phone unfortunately unavailable in the Netherlands because of a lawsuit by Philips for a patent, uh, but easily uh, obtainable through Amazon in Germany. So this was sent to me uh, about a week ago. And what makes this, this camera so special is that it has a two lenses, a wide-angle lens and a very high-quality regular lens that actually flips up and can also be used as a front-facing camera. So if I click on the photo app and then I want to make a selfie, you'll hear, you'll hear this. That zzz, that's the camera uh, flipping... Uh, flipping up and pointing forward. This has tremendous uh, advantages, of course. It, uh, it, it, for instance, it gives me a wide-angle front-facing camera, which is fantastic for selfies. It's always been my biggest problem with the old iPhone that I had is that the selfie camera is such low quality and is not wide-angle, so it's always very hard to fit everyone into the picture. With this wide-angle no problem whatsoever. Also amazing for vlogging, having being able to use a wide-angle camera when you're walking, uh, filming yourself. Uh, it gives so much more background and, and makes gives space and, and air to breathe to your videos. The other camera is just good. The, the wide-angle is, is not the same quality as the other camera, but it's good enough. And it's got HDR and a lot of tricks um, and uh, the the only thing that makes me a little bit queasy is is this mechanical aspect of it. So the camera flips up, and I'm thinking, oh, provided I don't drop this on the floor. Uh, apparently, it has a some kind of a safety mechanism when it 
detects that it's falling down, it will quickly close the camera so it can't break off. But I'm still. It has. It comes with a uh, with a case, a transparent case, hard plastic, and I don't like it at all. It's very slippery, and I've got sweaty hands, especially in this summer time. So I definitely need to get myself another case that has more grip it's kind of the problem with a lot of phones nowadays that they're so i mean they look beautiful on photos because they're so smooth and they have a glass back uh but it's not the best for you know holding it so that has uh spurned i think a, a huge uh, accessory accessory market for uh, for these casings another thing that i really enjoy about this camera uh, about this phone is the screen because it, there is no camera on the front at all because it flips up uh, this phone is completely bezel-less um, it has no no nudge nothing it's just one big screen and i i love that uh, it's it's a very nice it's an led uh, screen so it's not um, oled but I have to say, this is so much better than any phone I've ever had. So uh, I, I enjoy this. It gets pretty bright. Not as bright as the brightest phones on the market, but good enough to read in, in daylight. Uh, it's super fast. This one has the latest processor. So it's buttery smooth, scrolling, installing apps, even launching apps. Very, very fast. And, uh, and it, it has almost stock Android on it. It's one of the downsides of a, a non-iOS world is that every phone manufacturer can take Android and modify it. And so a lot of phones have bloatware and uh, they only issue um, updates very irregularly. Some phones, after two years, you don't get any updates whatsoever. Um, so this uh, Asus has uh, made sure that their... Um, uh, the the operating system is almost uh, like stock Android, and they are pledging to do very regular updates. They've even given the phone to a lot of uh, indie developers um, to to kind of improve on the on the uh, operating system. So that is probably gonna play a role in the longevity of this phone because if uh, if you have indie developers, uh, they can they can update the operating system long after the uh, the company itself has stopped doing that. Something, again, that you can't do in the world of iOS, like I have with the phone and with the iPad. Um, they're end of life. Uh, Apple is no longer going to bring me the newer updates. The OS, what is it, 13, won't be able to uh, to play on my old equipment. The, um, the last thing that I really love about this phone is the, uh, the battery. This has a 4,000 mega ampere i think f uh, battery it lasts almost two days uh, i've been using this thing non-stop for uh, the entire day and it's now only at 78 percent i can tell you even my ipad would be empty by now <laughs> so this is going to be amazing for my trips uh, like for instance when i'm going to walk those four days uh, next next week i can safely carry this with me the entire day i can uh, consult it, I can vlog with it, I can do so mu much with it, and, and the battery will still be um, probably only half uh, empty at the end of the day. Uh, and because of all this power, it can also run almost any program, games and uh, multimedia. Uh, I can play YouTube videos on this thing uh, all day long, and it still won't deplete the battery. Uh, that was very high up on my wish list. Um, and I'm very glad that this phone uh, does fulfill its promises. It even has a warning system. So at one point it was like, hmm, do you want extra assistance in, in, in optimizing your battery usage? Because we've noticed that you've plugged this in and then you didn't really uh, use your phone for a while. That's not very good for the, for the battery quality. So we can coach you. Do you want that? And I was like, yeah, sure. And so now it, it gives me tips on, the, well, this is when you have to charge it and uh, this is how you have to uh, how you can do optimal settings for this phone to last as as as, as long as possible um, there's one app that I uh, am going to purchase tonight probably and it's a it's a must-have app if you want to do any 
type of uh, video production. If you want to do video production on your phone, it's Filmic. Filmic is a, is a very advanced uh, camera uh, app that enables you to film in um, a flat profile. So normally when you use your phone to take pictures or to film video, what you don't know is that there's a lot of software um, that, that, that springs into action and tries to optimize your picture so that it is vibrant and it is, uh, you know, good looking. But that's not always very helpful when you're using uh, your phone to film video that you then later on want to use for professional productions, for instance. So with Filmic, you can film in S-Log, which is, uh, and, and there are some other names for this, basically the same uh, idea. You film with reduced uh, contrast, the, the colors are more muted, but the, the sensor of your, of your camera tries to capture as much detail as possible. But because it's trying to, to get as much detail in the, both in the, in the lighter parts of your picture and in the darker parts, the, the end result looks very flat, almost desaturated. But all the information is there, and then you can then import that video footage into your editing program, whether it's Avid or Premiere or Final Cut. And then you can use color grading to... to improve the the picture the the difference with the software that apple and android normally uh, applies to your pictures is that you are in control and uh, you can you can do whatever you want with that picture because as long as the information is there you can you can you can modify it um, but if the highlights are completely crushed or the blacks are crushed because of that, that optimization software uh, by Apple or, or Android, then there's no way you can correct that later on. Plus, the phones, n normally a phone will record in 30 frames per second or 29.8 frames per second, something like that. Uh, it's a standard that is very compatible with the American uh, uh, frame rates on television. So uh, if you are in, in North America and some other countries, your image is 60 hertz. So that means that um, it's refreshed 30 times per second um, interlaced. So that gives you a total uh, amount of frames like that, that you perceive of 60 frames. That's why um, telenovelas, you know, um, like cheap television, looks so, so, so extremely smooth and almost fake. Remember when The Hobbit came out and it was at this high frame rate, um, 20, 48 instead of 24, which is normally the frame rate of, of movies. And, and, and a lot of people were complaining, like, it doesn't look cinematic at all. But actually what you're seeing is a much better picture than the original uh, cinematic norm which was there to preserve um, cell celluloid, it's to, 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 to preserve film stock. And 24 frames per second is what you... It's kind of the minimum you need to get a more or less fluid movement. But then, of course, these, these um, on, in, in America, uh, 30 frames or 60 frames, that is very compatible with phones. That are also that's why phones are recording in 30 frames. The problem is here in Europe and in many other parts of the world, the the norm is not 60 hertz; it's 50. And so, our television is 25 frames per second. So every movie that is filmed in 24 frames per second is played here on television in 25 frames per second. That is why uh, the the audio, for instance, is slightly higher pitched. It's imperceptible, but I noticed this when I was filming my reaction videos to Star Wars trailers. And the Star Wars trailer on YouTube is usually posted in 24 frames per second. I was recording my reaction in 25 frames per second. And then I tried to insert um, the trailer in a little insert in, in, in my reaction video, and it didn't work because there were frames missing. And so the, the, uh, the, the thing in the beginning, the first few seconds are in sync, and then it gets more and more out of sync. So you see me react to, to something that has already been in the trailer, and then I seem to react like three seconds later. And it's because of this frame rate difference. 
So for, for me, that is a, that poses a big problem. It means I can't use a regular phone, like for instance my iPhone, I can't use that footage for television because then I have to down convert it from 30 frames to 25 frames per second. And that, cr or, yeah, and that creates a lot of, uh, of, of problems because then you have to fit 30 frames into 25 frames. So then the, your editing program will use frame blending, which is basically using two frames and squeeze them into one frame. And you get a lot of blurriness and it, it looks terrible. And even movement doesn't look smooth at all. Now, Filmic, the Filmic app, uh, doesn't work on all phones because it needs to be, the phone, the operating system, the ROMs, the whatever, needs to be open to Filmic's um, control. But Filmic will allow me to film in 30 frames per second, in 25 frames per second, in 100 frames per second. So it has variable frame rate, which is absolutely vital. So if I'm going to film during that uh, four-day walk for my TV show, I'll make sure that I'll film that with Filmic in 25 frames per second so that it is no problem for me to convert that. Uh, I've learned my lesson from my Camino that I filmed in 30 frames per second on the, on the iPhone and then I could not convert it to 25 frames. We've, we've, we spent days trying to down convert that and it still looks terrible <laughs> compared to the original. Now, this is all a temporary problem, of course, because these frame rates are redundant now that we live in the time of online video. And uh, when, if you watch Netflix, uh, without you knowing, it's actually constantly changing frame rates. You have stuff that is filmed 50 frames per second, 24 frames per second, 30 frames per second, 100 frames per second. Um, who cares? Your, your television is adapting to the source. Um, but not so for television. Television always goes through these, you know, the, the equipment of the companies, of the broadcasting companies, and that they only work in the frame rate and in the frequency, the standard frequencies of that particular country. So uh, con uh, converting a, a, a movie that is made in, in Europe to, um, for American audiences always creates problems. And that's why you need like very sophisticated hardware and software to to kind of convert that in a way that is acceptable. But for most of us, that is way too expensive and, and a very time-consuming uh, um, process. So I'd rather film in the frame rate that is necessary for my particular target audience. All right, that's it for today. That's what I wanted to share with you. I'm super glad with this Asus. I hope I don't drop it because that's the only thing that scares me. What will happen if I drop this on the floor? And by the way, one last thing that I love about this phone, it's got a fingerprint reader that finally works. Oh man, I missed that for years. And its uh, I don't want to go back. Thank you for listening. Uh, next couple of weeks, I will not be producing regular podcasts, but I will be on YouTube. And the reason, of course, is that I don't have access to the to, to my studio equipment when I'm walking and also in Ireland. I'm not taking any, any of that with me, but I will be creating video stuff. And if you want to follow me, make sure you're subscribed to my Facebook and Twitter accounts and Instagram for the photos. That's all Father Roderick. And also make sure you subscribe to my YouTube channel over at youtube.com slash Father Roderick for the vlogs. All right, thanks for listening. Thanks to my patrons at patreon.com. For them, I'm going to record my little uh, after show. And if you want to have access to that after show, which is a special podcast for my supporters, then become one. Go to, over to patreon.com slash Father Roderick. You can already become a patron for just one buck a month. What is one buck a month? Anyway, thank you so much, and I will talk to you soon. Take care, and God bless. And that's a wrap. Okay, final after show, and then I'm going home. And for the after show, I'm going to go through your comments as well. Hello and welcome to the after show. I'm Father Roderick, and uh, this is the last after show for the next three weeks. Next week, I'll be walking the four days of Nijmegen, 40 kilometers a day, 160 kilometers for charity. And uh, the, the Monday after that, I'm going to Ireland for a short 
But I can say, honestly, well-deserved vacation. I'm really looking forward to it. So I won't be podcasting then, but I may post the occasional video. So make sure you subscribe to my YouTube channel over at youtube.com slash Father Roderick. Um, and then on YouTube, I get that question. So like, I'm subscribed to your channel, but I don't see new videos. There is this bell icon underneath the, the subscription uh, button. And if you click that, you will get notification when, for, for instance, when I'm, when, when I'm doing live shows, which I'm always doing whenever I'm in Rome or, uh, or maybe also in, in Ireland. Um, I may go live every once in a while. You, you may want to have that notification when I get, go live. Otherwise, you, you miss all the action. Um, I'm just going through quickly through the questions that were asked while I was recording the show and the comments that were posted there. Um, so Arnold asks, uh, what's my opinion about the GoPro Hero 7 Black? I, don't, I have a very old GoPro, but I hear the GoPro Hero 7 is amazing when it comes to image stabilization. So it's uh, very, very high resolution, and it's got excellent software. I still don't really like the shape of a GoPro. It's kind of unwieldy, a little, little block like that. I, I, when I'm filming, I want to hold something that feels like a camera or a phone that gives me you know, something to hold on to. It's very difficult to, to make smooth movements with a, a little square. So I'm, I'm not a fan of, of, the, of GoPros. I don't see much use for them. But um, I can imagine if you do sports, for instance, uh, that, that, that may be a very good choice. GoPro is definitely a brand that, has, uh, that is still market leader. Adam is surprised that I'm using show notes for this show. I thought that it was all in, in my head. <laughs> so I, my show notes are super short. I, I make my show notes, by the way, in OneNote, which is uh, by Microsoft. Switched to OneNote because I was using this other notif notation. What was it? Ever Evernote. I was using Evernote, and then uh, they raised the prices, and I was like, eh, I'll just switch to the free alternative. But my show notes are usually just five or six lines, just topics, and then the rest is indeed coming from my head. John says, I had such a bad night. I was drinking alcohol with my friends and ended up throwing up for an hour and feeling sick for another two hours. I never want to be sick like that again. I may just give up drinking entirely. Uh, <laughs> and then Kevin replies to that, John, just remember to tell yourself that alcohol isn't really good for you. And if you do still want to drink, remember to pace yourself and eat some food with it. Uh, Kevin is 17, almost 18. Yeah, and Europe drinking age is a bit lower than elsewhere in the world. Um Yeah, drinking a lot is... Uh, d drinking alcohol in itself is not beneficial at all. Um, a lot of the, um, the, the fake science has been debunked. <laughs> it's, uh, even small doses of alcohol will already impact your brain um, and, and cause damage because it's, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's poisonous alcohol. Um, now, of course, I, I'm an occasional uh, uh, drinker of wine. Uh, I'm a priest, so <laughs> when I celebrate Mass, there's a little bit of wine. But I d I'm very uh, intolerant of alcohol. I, I, I drink, uh, when I drink one glass of wine, I already get tipsy and I'm not very focused anymore. If I drink more than that, I get sleepy. I fall asleep. I'm not the type of person who becomes very energetic and chatty. And no, I just get very sleepy. But at the same time, I've noticed that alcohol, especially in the evening, it really disrupts my sleep. And that, too, is, is known that uh, if you drink alcohol late in the evening, you will sleep much worse. You, you will, will not enter the deep sleep phases that are necessary for recovery. So you may fall asleep very quickly, um, but, it, but the rest will not uh, bring you, uh, will not help you recover. Uh, so alcohol and sports, for instance, a very bad combination. I always tell myself, if I need alcohol to have a good time with my friends, then I don't have the right friends. Or I may not be the right friend for my friends because it's totally possible to have a, a great time with friends without drinking alcohol. So, um, I, I, you know, I like these little things like tasting. Uh, we have these tasting ses sessions of, of um, 
uh, whiskey, which is what I did with uh, the other priest that I'm going on vacation with. Um, but the, we're, we're, we're drinking like droplets of whiskey just to, to kind of like, oh, this one is more earthy and this one. And it's more of a, a funny thing. But I really dislike drinking large am uh, amounts of alcohol. I can't stand it. it. I just get sick and I feel sick. Um, so, yeah, I would say if you drink, only drink something you actually really want to taste, make it as special. It's like food. You know, you can stuff yourself with fast food, but it's much better to enjoy food, eat less, but really choose quality if you when you're eating and enjoy that and savor it. Um, it's not the quantity, it's about the quality that will give you the most enjoyment. That would be my uh, reaction to that. Uh, Arnold has a Star Wars-related question. Why wasn't Anakin attacked by the clones when Order 66 was executed? Order 66 was the order, of, I think, by the Emperor to Palpatine to destroy all Jedi and eradicate all the Jedi. And, of course, Anakin was a Jedi as well. Arnold continues, he had a bunch of clone troopers with him when he entered the Jedi Temple to kill all the younglings. Hmm. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> I guess because Anakin was already in cahoots with Palpatine. So he was actually helping a Palpatine to, uh, to kill the Jedi. And one of the reasons that Darth Vader was so feared is because he was one of the executioners. He's kind of the soul, you know, soul, later became St. Saint Paul, was one of the persecutors of the early Christians. And, and Vader, before his reconversion to the light side at the end of uh, Return of the Jedi, was kind of feared in the same way because he was killing all those Jedi and helping the Emperor to, uh, to get rid of, of uh, the only force in the universe that could, um, that could threaten him. Uh, so we, we, we've been talking about the caterpillars on, um, on the show and, uh, this is all these, these, these changes in our climate and also the monoculture in, in our countries where we don't have enough, we don't, we don't let nature be nature and solve the problems themselves. That's how you get plagues. But according to Arnold, the caterpillar plague is almost gone, but now we get another one that's coming South European ants. Oh boy. And they're like the the these critters that you can get the bed ones, the, the the bed what is it? Bed 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 bugs. Um so apparently these ants are also extremely painful when they bite you and they they don't belong here but but the, it's because of the higher temperatures that are starting to spread. And again, we it would be such a problem if we gave nature the ability to have natural enemies of those of those nasty creatures. So we, we really need to think, rethink how we uh, how we organize our cities and, and villages. And then I talked about spiders, and Arnold wants to know if I ever saw the movie Arachnophobia. Yes, yes, I hated that movie. Oh boy. Oh boy, I was so afraid of spiders and that movie made it uh, <laughs> much worse. Uh, Aiden is, you're coming to Ireland. I live in Ireland. And I can't wait to watch the Ireland videos. Well, that's so cool, Aiden. From which part of Ireland are you? Because um, I'm going to the left of Dublin, west of Dublin. We're going to be in the countryside. Now, Ireland, of course, is a big country. Um, but it's always cool to uh, to go to places where my listeners and my viewers live. Uh, like when I went to Poland, I had a lot of fans on YouTube, Polish fans, that loved that I was going to Poland and I did vlogs in their country. They were so proud of, uh, of, of, of their culture. Uh, John wants to know if this video is available later. Yes, it is. This is, uh, this is just part of the a playlist on YouTube called Live Podcast Recordings or something like that. So, uh, yeah, you can always uh, listen back to it or, or put it in the background when, while you're doing other things. And then we have a, a very Polish name. Uh, can't really pronounce it. Uh, and that visitor in the chat wants to know, what is Satan doing in, West, in the Western world today? Well, what Satan always does, and that is lying 
and creating division and making people afraid and bringing, making people doubt love and, and God's love uh, more specifically. So whenever you see uh, confusion and anger, it's, it's kind of a bit what, what Yoda warns us uh, against in the Star Wars universe. It's anger, fear, hatred, all that leads to the dark side. Those are also symptoms of of Satan, of, of uh, what, what the devil is doing, and that is to lure people away from faith. And faith is another word for trust and uh, confidence in God. And so whenever you see symptoms like that, well, you can bet that he's, he's working, he's doing his thing. But of course, Satan would be pretty powerless unless... If it weren't for people that help him, and and uh, so if you see in your own view, the, the question is not where is Satan. The question is always where do I see, see symptoms in my own behavior that show that I'm actually following those those temptations, and I'm I'm angry, and I'm dividing people, and I I'm not loving enough. Whenever you see behavior, uh, your own behavior going that in that direction, make sure that you go to confession, make sure you find spiritual help to become a better person. That's the best way to combat Satan. All uh, right. Um, Aiden lives uh, in Dublin. Oh, that's cool. We will be in Dublin, I think, on the first day. Just keep following me on Facebook and on YouTube. You'll, you'll see where I am. Michael is from Ohio in the USA. First time live. Well, welcome. It's good to see you. Well, actually, I can't see you. You can see me. <laughs> How do you deal with more young people today becoming non-believers? How do I deal with them? Um, I try to hang out with them. I try to appreciate what's good in them. I try to um, to tell, to communicate what what inspires me in my faith. And uh, I try to be open to their questions. So that's how I do that. I, 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 I build Lego and I, I post that on YouTube or I'm streaming on YouTube and uh, we're talking about Lego. But at the same time, I'm a priest. So <laughs> very quickly, I will, every time I build Lego, I get questions about faith and I give answers. And I don't try to convert anyone because that's a futile attempt. Um, that's not up to me. That's God does that. But... And I'm not trying to convince people, but I'm I'm witnessing. I'm I'm telling what inspires me. I'm trying to honestly reply to their questions, um, even when I'm not sure. Even when I don't, uh, I have my own doubts, or I'm I'm I. I it's hard. Sometimes it's hard. It's really hard to explain your faith, because faith is also something of the heart, and that's difficult sometimes to translate in words. But I I just try to speak from the heart and. I always ask the Holy Spirit to to tell me, to let me know what I what I should share. So that's how I. Uh, one thing you have to do is never panic, never, never despair. Uh, God is always able to reach younger generations. He has been doing that for two thousand years. <laughs> so uh, if you despair, you're actually doubting God's God's strength and and His ability to reach us directly. Um, and, you know, atheism is, uh, is a bit, uh, it's trendy, but it's also a trend that loses ad uh, ad 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 adepts very, very quickly. I think it's the religion, because a, a, a lot of times atheism is like a religion, but it's a religion with the, the most defectors <laughs> compared to other religions. So, never panic. Uh, will I be broadcasting from my huge walk? Maybe, maybe. I'm certainly going to film some vlogging stuff, but maybe I'll go, I'll go live. Yeah, just keep an eye on YouTube. Um, John says, this is why atheists and Catholics need to help each other like you have helped me. We can get along despite the differences. In short, I hope to get more of your advice. Sure, John, that, that's what we're... Before we're believers or non-believers, what we always are first is we are brothers and sisters. We are here, we're human beings, we live in the same culture, uh, we speak the same language, and we're here to help, or at least I hope we are, <laughs> and we can help each other. 
And that goes that is goes much deeper than our differences. And of course, no one is Im- immutable. Uh, we can always change. And I've learned a lot in my life. And I've I now believe things that I didn't believe when I was young, and vice versa. So, so uh, always in motion, the future is Yoda would say, <laughs> and that's true also. And you learn by by asking questions, by listening to each other. And uh, even if you don't agree with someone else, it never hurts to listen and to learn and to empathize. All right, it's time for me to go home. I need to cook, and then I'm going to probably watch some movies or something like that. I'm not going to do anything complicated tomorrow. I've got two masses, and then I'm going to play a board game. All that to kind of block out of my conscience that I have to go walk 160 kilometers in a few days from now, which is kind of scary. (laughs) Anyway, you'll uh, get updates um, through the usual channels. Thank you for being a patron, and uh, thank you for your support, for your prayers, and for your interest, and for your time. Talk to you soon. That's a wrap. I'm going to put this online very quickly. So all that chatter is recorded on this tiny little memory card. I can't believe it. It's just, isn't it amazing? You can, you can, you can put a movie worth of footage on, on just a tiny little chip. And it's pretty robust as well. So I'm going to put it in this uh, converter or holder. So I can put it in the back of my computer. Wait, there is another card in there. It's probably the SD card that I use in my audio recorder. Mm, Come on. Where is it? Ah, there. I can never find (laughs) the slot for the SD card. Um, the um, roadcaster records in Wave, which of course is the best quality. It's lossless. It has one downside, and that is I have to convert it to MP3. Um, which I will do now in Adobe Audition, which is my go to application for audio. Um, then I'm going to post it to Google Drive. Let's see, what's the episode number? 115. Okay. And this is after show. Good. Let's launch Audition. Starting to get hungry. Fortunately, I've got some takeaway Chinese in the fridge, so I don't have to cook. Just need to press the button on the microwave. (laughs) Uh, There we go carry these here. So this is also something I've never broadcast. The whole process of um, the post-production. And I'm only doing a very small part of post-production. Usually it's Inge. But since I'm recording this over the weekend, she'll have to do that next week. Um... Where is it, chat? Okay, yeah. So I closed the application. I can't see the chat anymore. Window. Overlay, preferences, comments and reactions. There it is. There it is. Now I can see you. Have you listened to the new Atron album? I listened to a song, I think, on uh, Spotify the other day. Ed Sheeran. I must say it's not exactly my... Ooh, what is this? A Pinterest of Lego Skylines? Oh, that is awesome. I need to add that to my Pinterest account. 
how did that pop up all of a sudden? <laughs> I've used Pinterest to uh, gather photos of a monastery kitchen because we're going to build something that resembles a monastery kitchen upstairs. And Pinterest is a... I never use Pinterest. But in this case, it's very good to quickly gather photos on a board. All right, here's the waveform. As you can tell, it's very um, uh, stable. It's because of the compression that happens on the limiter. This would probably be good enough, but I'm going to check. Sometimes the roadcaster adds some white noise towards the end. So I'm now zooming in on the waveforms, removing that little pause at the beginning. And then I go all the way to the end of the episode. Yeah, there is static. Still don't know why that happens. Okay, it's gone now. And then I just select the entire thing and I um, maximize the volume. So normalizing this, which makes it easier to listen to, for instance, on a phone without earbuds or on an iPad. A lot of the tablets have uh, very mediocre speakers. So I'm always optimizing the audio before I upload it. Save as, um, let's go to Google Drive, post-production, uh, Father Roderick, completed shows, change the format to MP3, and that's 115, there we go. And then I'm changing the bitrate. Oh, why is the bitrate 112? That's not right. It should be 128. Well, that's weird. It's got a different setting now, different default setting. It's a good thing I checked. So down converting this to 120 kbps. CBR, constant bitrate. So it's compatible with almost any MP3 player. Um, usually what I do is I, um, I, I make like a compilation picture. I'll show you that in a minute. The artwork is very important for the show, especially now that I'm posting these on YouTube. Artwork can really help finding a bigger audience. I do that in Canva. Um, I created a template f especially for my podcast. Secret behind the scenes information. Don't tell anyone. All right, so this is the show, number one. And then this is the after show, 16 minutes. Sounds about right. Same check. Normally the beginning is okay. And I go all the way to the end. Oh, bit two big spikes of white noise. So weird. Select all, normalize, apply. And we're going to save that as an MP3. And this one I'm going to convert into mono. Because there are no jingles in this one. And then I'm changing the bitrate to the half of the stereo bitrate. So 64 kbps. There we go. Yes. That's just to save um, server space on the provider, the podcast provider that I'm using. The, qu the quality is equal when it's mono. Okay, so that's the two files. Now I'm going to, re I'm going to make the, um, the artwork. Um, hello, hello. 
So what I do is I go to Canva. What's this? Here we go. And I just go to my previous designs. So this is the template. And I just um, modify the existing one. I don't think I created... Did I create artwork for last week? Maybe not. Apollo 11. Did I do Apollo 11 last week? I think I did. Yes, I did. Okay, that's good. So 115 last time I used the color blue. I think I'm going to do uh, purple. So I just copy this one. And I've got an identical one. And I... Um, Detective Pikachu. I hope I spelled that right. So I'm just putting the the uh, the themes in there that uh, may attract the the most interest. So I usually put the review there first. What else have I talked about? Uh, Peter Jackson or The Making of Middle Earth or Fantastic Beasts. What, which one am I going to do? Um, I'd say Peter Jackson. Uh, the second one... Uh, what's another topic? Uh, I talked about spiders, yes. Caterpillars. Caterpillars. Now that one is a little bit too big, so I gotta make this one slightly longer. There we go. Caterpillars and then the uh, Zenphone, Asus Zenphone 6. Okay. And then I need to find some pictures. And you have to be very careful with the pictures. Because you can't use copyright stuff, of course. Except for the film, the movie reviews. I'm just going to get one of those Pikachu photos. This one looks good. Yeah, that's fine. Open image in new tab. But yeah, uh, sometimes if you use copyrighted images and you get caught, then poof, you have to pay a lot of money. Um, so let's see how that looks, of course, because there are letters in the middle of the thing, of the frame, so... Not every picture works. Where did I save it? Uh, to the desktop. So I'll just post it there. I'll take it and it slides into the background. Oh, you see? Now you only see the eyes. One way to solve that is to just select a title and put it slightly below. I like that. Oops. A little bit more to the... Okay, that's more or less in the center. I'll uh, lower Father Roderick a little bit. Yeah, that's pretty eye-catching. Um, and then, of course, Peter Jackson. That's more difficult because I can't use any official portraits of him. I usually go to Pixabay, which has copyright-free images. And just type in what I'm looking for. Peter Jackson, of course, can't find anything. Middle Earth. Let's see what comes up. Oh. Well, the usual. The Golden Ring. And the Shire. I'll just take the ring. 
uh, free download. We'll download it to uh, HD to the desktop. It's a small picture anyway. There we go. Now, of course, I can make it a little bit bigger. So it has, fills the frame a little bit better. That looks great. Caterpillars. Ugh. I'm pretty sure they don't have, oh, these are these nasty caterpillars. I hate them. Oh. I already get an itch when I see these. Oh, yuck. Yes, that's them. That is them. Boo. Okay, I'll take, I'll take the biggest one because I'm going to zoom in on those caterpillars. I just typed in the Dutch name of that caterpillar <laughs> and it showed up in, in Pixabay. Oh, my gosh. All right. Caterpillars open show in Finder. And port it into Canva. Put it there. Oh, well, see, that sometimes happens. Uh, I noticed that the um, the colors don't don't fit to, together very well. So this color is very close to this color. So what I then do. Oops. Is I take this one and can I put it elsewhere? No, I can't. Wait. I can take that same photo. Uh, uploads. And put it here. And just move these around. I'll put the Zen phone in the middle. The Zen phone, I'm just going to take a promotional picture. That shouldn't be a problem either. Um, let's see. Usually, I need to find one. Oh, yeah, there here we go just from the ACES website. That's usually the safest thing to do. Um, maybe this. Yeah, let's take this one. Open image. Show in Finder. This is a very laborious process, and I normally didn't do that. In the past, I didn't do this. But I'm just thinking that this may help for YouTube. Maybe not. Let's see if I can make that a whole lot bigger to show that camera. Something like this. Yeah. See, now there is contrast between those two pictures. I'm going to enhance the caterpillars a little bit. Make them a whole lot bigger so you can tell that they're actually caterpillars. Oh. They're terrible. They're <laughs> absolutely terrible. Okay, let's see. You. There we go. Download. 
download it in JPEG. Which one? Page number four. Done. Download. Save that to Google Drive. Post production. Father Roderick. Graphics. 115. Save. Okay. And then later on, I will uh, add this picture also to the YouTube uh, recording. Well, now it's finally... Let's see. Oh, there's some more questions and remarks here in the chat. Thank you for your previous answer. I was wondering if you had heard about the sequel to Mel Gibson's The Passion of the Christ that will focus on Jesus' death. This time in hell and resurrection. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I've talked about that uh, um, during one of my Lego sessions as well. I'm, I'm curious what he's going to do. There's, I mean, it's fifty days between the resurrection and and Pentecost, so ample material, I'd, I'd say, for a, for a movie. Nicole, from Alberta, Canada. I have a Facebook and Twitter feed developed to help spread the word of Marian consecration and St. Maximilian Kolb. Do you have any advice? Um, yeah, think, think about your target audience. Who do you want to reach with this? And um, why would they follow that page? So you need to find people that probably are already thinking about doing consecration. So that's a very niche target audience and so you have to give them some value so that they can perceive the value into following that and eventually also consecrating themselves so as always put yourself in the in the mindset of the and in the in the position of the person that you want to reach what does that person look like what things is he following or she is following you know, how do you get in touch with that person um and social media is great uh, because it's free and it's easy to make, but it's also very hard because, well, there's a lot of stuff out there. So how do you reach that particular audience? The best way um, is to contribute to other people's Facebook pages. Uh, for instance, as you can post as page and answer questions, for instance, if you know of circles where people are talking about these type of matters and and and, su and make suggestions. Make, make just be careful not to spam people. Um, I have a blog and share video reflections, but this is my first time using social media like this, out of my comfort zone. Yeah, yeah. The thing is, um, don't expect too much. It's not. It's not a magic pill. It's not that if you have a Facebook page that immediately it will reach other people. Um, it's usually through what what works best in my experience is if you can help other people instead of making them a proposition out of the blue. Like if you would walk the street in your hometown and someone would walk up to you and say, hey, I have something I want to propose you, a, a, a religious proposal. I'm a priest, but I would like, uh, maybe some other time and I would walk away, you know, and so... Uh, faith, I think, grows best on on friendship and on having a common language, and so so that's why I would say mingle with similar groups, um, and uh, uh, make sure that you communicate the value that it has for them, uh, and not just like I think this is important and you should do that, because then most people will shy away. And, and just trial and error. Just try try things out. And if it doesn't stick, uh, try something else. Have you seen Jumanji, the next level trailer? Yes. Yes, I've seen that. Uh, it was funny. I'm not a huge fan of the, of the first movie. It was entertaining, but... Oh, well. Mukensteins enjoyed watching Bag End last night. Yes, I'm almost sorry it's over because it was a lot of fun. I have one more Middle-earth build. The fight between Saruman and 
Saruman the White and Gandalf the Grey. <laughs> Alrighty, I've answered all your questions, so I'm out of here. Thank you so much for uh, accompanying me, and have a wonderful weekend. Cheers. <laughs>